going live now. Great. Great. Hey guys, uh, we are here for our next uh, session. It's going to be about the power. Hello. All right, so we're off to our next session now. It's around the power of cross-chain DeFi applications. And I will let the speakers uh, take it from here. Great, thank you. So happy to be here. This is the first session of what will be four different ones um, uh, around uh, but Polkadot, but also more broadly, um, DeFi applications. And so firstly, it'd be good for us to all introduce ourselves. Um, I can go first. I'm Jack. Uh, I work at Web3 Foundation on Polkadot and uh, most more recently Kusama as well. And um, Web3 Foundation ha is, is a Swiss foundation. It's, it's kind of the, the nucleus of the Polkadot ecosystem and the um, raised and issue, raised funds and issued the DOT token as well as funded the development and uh, employ the researchers behind the Polkadot protocol. And then a couple other uh, protocols um, connecting um, to Ethereum and the broader Web3 web ecosystem. Uh, and then I have with me uh, Rory Tao and Vance, so please introduce yourselves. Uh, hey, I'm Vance Spencer. I run Framework, which is a DeFi fund with a focus on token economics and governance. Hey, I'm Ray Tao. Um, so I'm a builder on the public ecosystem. We're currently building two projects, uh, building Arcala, which is a stable coin and a finance platform as a project for the public ecosystem. We're also building Lamina, which is a synthetic asset and a margin trading platform on the public um, network. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you both for being here. So the, the title of the panel is called uh, The Power of Cross-Chain DeFi Applications. And um, on the panel, uh, I, I'm at a layer one in that I work mostly on, on Polkadot and, and Kusama stuff. Um, uh, Roy Tao, you're kind of at a layer one, but also potentially layer two in that you're building your own, your own chain um, and applications around it. Uh, and 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 Vance, you're you're at a VCC. You, you you invest at Framework Ventures across the stack. Um, so I guess my first question would be just broadly, what are the what are the things you're more excited in, about in DeFi, and and um, uh, what what are the latest um, developments that you've seen that you've been more excited about cross chain DeFi applications specifically? Um. So for, I mean, things we're excited about right now in DeFi is, uh, I think last week, which was the future swap alpha was really surprising to a lot of people picked up about, you know, $17 million of volume in three days. And I think that's really the first instance of product market fit that we've seen in DeFi. And so I think the market is sending us a giant signal that, you know, for decentralized perpetual swaps, which is, you know, BitMEX's main product for, for people who don't know that, you know, there's a vein of product market fit and profitability and scale for, for DeFi businesses. And so I think that is the first of, you know, many signs where you hit on perpetual swaps and then you build options that are decentralized and then you build interesting synthetic assets. And so the intersection of liquidity pools, leverage and synthetic assets is, is basically what we're the most interested in right now. I think, you know, for me, there's this concept of, you know, when is cross-chain DeFi interesting? And I think the answer is like, you know, eventually a project will outgrow Ethereum. So like stable coins are in danger of doing this right now. Like the, the systemic importance of stable coin volume to Ethereum is, is a very outsized. And so eventually when you build these businesses, do you move to another chain, which you have control of? Like which chain is it? Does it fall under a polka dot kind of governance structure or is it an application specific blockchain like Cosmos? And so I think that's where this really gets the interesting to me from a focus and then like what we think is gonna happen perspective. For yeah. sure. Go ahead, Roy Tom. Yeah, I sort of um, echo that. So the, I mean, what gets me excited is that the mature of those, uh, of these next generation platforms, such as Polkadot, where you can take a shot and you have like full customizability on what you are trying to develop. You can pretty much customize everything, and while the security is still provided by the Polkadot um, 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 validators. So those is like the things that wouldn't, wouldn't be possible before, such as like if you want to, um, for example, if you want to have a stable coin, and every time you transact with that stable coin, you want to pay the fee in the term of the stable coin, but not in the, the native token, the network, you can now start to do that. So those is like the things that really um, excites me, like you can have the full customized facility without actually sacrificing security. Yeah, and, and for those don't, that don't know, um, 
Polkadot's model is, is essentially there's a relay chain and you can build blockchains and you have and the, the token model is such that you inflate your own token away a little bit to pay the relay chain so that you create a loop. So DOT's really more of a chain or application facing token than anything. It's, it's proof of stake as well to, to, and it provides security and interoperability to other parachain shards or to external blockchains like Ethereum or Bitcoin um, and you lock DOT and, and potentially inflate your token away slightly to do that in the short term. But in the long term, right now to the economics of that, um, and for Akala as a stablecoin and synthetic asset platform paying for security um, and access to the other applications and in, in chains in Polkadot, um, you have like kind of a two step, it's, uh, like with this decentralized sovereign wealth fund DAO, where you intend mm -hmm. to actually um, collect fees on your staking mm -hmm. derivative token for DOTs. Yep. And, uh -huh. um, and and use those excess dots to eventually pay for uh, and lease indefinitely, a, like a parachain shard, for example. Yeah. Could you explain a little bit how you approach the economics of building in the Polkadot ecosystem and why you you came up with this more innovative approach? Yeah, actually, there's like a lot of um, potential problems that this model can solve. So, um, as this blockchain space matures, uh, we realize that dot is probably the one of the first token that has more uh, that has more than just all the value it has a utility in it so if you host dot you actually has the ability to bond for a power chance so that's one utility access you can also stake and get some return for your stake dot and the model of the power chance that hey initially when you're operating a business you need to rent an office if you put it this way right so if you want to operate a business you need to rent for an for an, an shard in this particular uh, network so um, in order for you to bootstrap that, you need people to support you um, with their dots. They are not actually giving out your dots. They are basically just like supporting your network by bonding the dots to secure a project, slot for the for the project. And once you do that, um, the project actually go off, and the product is actually generating revenues. Uh, in the MakerDAO's model, is that hey, those um, those revenues used to buy back um, the Maker token to reflect the values uh, in the in the token holders. But in the Polkadot design, in our design, we actually think about something else like, hey, why um, instead of burning our native token, we can also acquire those revenues in DOTS. And by acquiring those revenues in DOTS, it gives us more than just um, the valuation of the token. That means slowly and slowly, the network is going to acquire enough DOTS that it can become shelf substainable. That means it can buy the project slot for itself. And from that point, additional revenue could be decided, hey, should we continue to acquire the dot or should we um, buy back our token and burn it? Or maybe we can start to invest in other power chains to give us access to the other network and give us utility to the other network. So the potential is pretty much um, endless. Um, and the priority goal for us right now is that once the network goes to life, all the revenue will be used to secure um, enough dot to make sure that the, the, the network is sure sustainable. Um, the analogy I've been using is that, hey, you're operating a business, you have to pay rent. And once you make enough revenue, you start to own the building that you, you, that you own, and then you don't have to pay rent. And gradually you might own more buildings and people start to pay you rent, right? Right, and I mean, you've taken the uh, approaches to your tokenomics, at least initially in the economic paper you released about 30 or 34%. ACA will be going in part to pay for a six-year parachain lease um, mm -hmm. with a fixed supply. And I know Vance, you, you've you've advocated with another stablecoin project in a different ecosystem, in Cosmos ecosystem, for a inflationary model to pool liquidity. I mean, you you said that the power of DeFi is you see it is is most importantly in liquidity pool the the intersection of liquidity pools, leverage, and uh, synthetic assets. Um, and and so. You know, in the in the Kava example, I think you advocated for increasing one of those. Was it liquidity with inflating the 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 governance token in that stablecoin cross chain application, or what? Yeah. So I mean, you know, you can basically spend like you can think of uh, the inflation of a token as basically like your budget for the year. Like if you're if you're like a chain. And basically, you can spend it on growth, so you can incentivize user behaviors to mint the, the stablecoin, to hold the stablecoin if you want to decrease velocity. You know, if you want to direct inflation into a pool that already does things, like FutureSwap, which just applies leverage, 
you can direct inflation to those types of pools to get people to put that in there and have it be used as money. And I think, you know, that's one thing you can do with an inflationary supply. The other thing you can do is, is play defense. You can incentivize people to build composability of the assets. So an example of that would be if you had a stable coin pool of four different stable coins, making a metal meta stable coin and then incentivizing people to hold that. So like there's just different ways you can use inflation. And I think our point on that is, you know, you just want to have as many tools as possible when you grow, when you start to grow a network in terms of, you know, being able to incentivize user behavior. It's just, you know, it's not doing you any favors to have a low supply um, that is not inflationary. Um, but that being said, it's all context specific. Uh, you know, if Akala has a certain model that is fundamentally different, maybe inflation uh, takes a back seat. But but it's it's kind of hard to imagine what world that would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the model of Akala is initially we do have an inflation model that is like thirty four of thirty five percent of those um Akala token are gonna be minted by those who are supporting us um bonding adults, security projects, so those will be an inflation period. Those were minted on a per block basis, but after that, ultimately, we want to we want to make sure that the the network itself generate enough revenue. So, at least we're going to an an, an flat model rather than inflation. Mm -hmm. And the additional inflation will be coming from the yield from the asset that this protocol itself owns. It's owned by the protocol, not owned by any individuals, right? Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's one of the more exciting things, right, with, with DAOs. And I think a couple different DeFi projects have redone their token model in the Ethereum ecosystem over the past 12 months to implement DAOs that allow them to um, coordinate fund spending, whether, whether that's the, the native token or a different token, on different um, activities that increase the utility of the, of the application. And Akala takes the route of not only doing that, but um, custodying other tokens, right? There's now a chain that's able to to use governance coordination to to buy and custody other assets um, that it's connected to. Um, yeah. But switching gears a little bit to um, uh, what makes a viable DeFi platform generally, um, and and everyone has a unique perspective on this as well. I mean, whenever I think about it from a layer one perspective from Polkadot. You need a couple of things just to make DeFi worthwhile, and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. It's definitely a bit a, a bridges to other assets. If you're just starting today as a layer one, right? It's 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 bridges to uh, larger collateral pools in Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's the ability to, to 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 build the the business logic and smart contracts to actually have that composability and the money Legos that have appeared on on Ethereum. Um, it's definitely stable coins, or st at least one really solid stable coin. Akala is the first announced stable coin on um, decentralized um, stable coin on Polkadot. Um, so that's key. And, and then other assets is what we hear a lot. Is is you need other assets, right? For for Dex to be um, worthwhile to deploy, uh, you need assets to trade on it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, Akala also starts building other assets in the L dot um, and staking derivative for for polka dot um, and I assume you you intend to have other assets on there as well what what are the, you, what, what are the main things you guys believe needs to be on a layer one platform for DeFi to be attracted to it uh, liquidity in one word uh, liquidity is the lifeblood of any DeFi projects, like, you know, if you're starting out in your platform, you're basically saying, okay, how do I get to my first million liquidity? Second, you know, or like, how do I get to my first 10 million? Then it's like 50, then it's like 100. And there's these kind of invisible asymptotes that you hit because um, just the market cap of the underlying assets on that chain are, are only of a certain size. Like, you know, Maker is having a really hard time reaching 100, 120 million in debt. Like, that's kind of the total market size of the ETH whales that are willing to bankroll uh, a CDB platform. So like liquidity is the most important thing. Uh, in a world where interoperability is real, that definitely goes away. Uh, but like, I think that world is still a year away, you know, reliably. Um, but like th there's this, there's a lot to be said about cornering a specific target audience. So like, you know, if you're the first DeFi platform on Cosmos, you know, you'll naturally attract Atom holders. They just want to get leverage and utility out of that token. Polkadot, the same thing. Like you have these mini network effects that kind of work both ways. Um, so like, I'm personally excited to see 
a lot of interoperability, start to build bridges to these kind of isolated asset classes, bring DeFi to Ripple, bring DeFi to Zcash, bring DeFi to whatever chain. So I think that's an underestimated market size that people kind of haven't thought about yet. Yeah, I, I echo that. I agree that liquidity probably is the most important stuff we're gonna be, be, to drive a successful DeFi protocol. Um, the other two things that I think is also important for a DeFi protocol to be successful from the layer one's point of view is that security. Um, it's often being overlooked, but the, um, the value of a DeFi protocol can be only as valuable as the underlying ledger, right? Otherwise, it become a security problem. Like people could overtake your, your platform if it's easier to un attack the underlying layer. And that's something um, we really like with Polydor is that because Polydor itself is also yeah, a very mature network with a lot of um, holders. Um, we're pretty sure that it's going to be provide superior security in terms of like the DeFi chain or the DeFi um, apps that's going to evolve on top of that. Um, the second key instrument to look at is probably performance. Um, I, I think performance is very important um, in terms of like, the transaction throughput um, to enable, how, how do I say that? It's like, um, if you look at MakerDAO, if you look at the, what's currently happened on the Ethereum one, there's a technical limit of how much risk you're able to take um, because the limitation of the land underlying ledger. So that's what happened on the MakerDAOs um, when, the, when, the, when the ETH price crashed. Um, the, the network is just so congested that liquidation can't happen enough so performance is another key thing to make sure that um, the DeFi protocol can scale so those is the two things i look for the, the layer one protocol when we decide to build something on top of it's interesting so one question i had recently that i've that i've um uh, i think cello is 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 planning to launch in the next week or two um and it's it's a platform that's a standalone right layer one uh, but it's been able to 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 gain um, a foothold in, in an idea of just having open finance. So I guess remittances and wallets and other, so it's it's kind of a different perspective than that of just focus on a DeFi um, stable coin. Um, do you guys believe that there's gonna be stable coins for different um, use cases uh, across the stack? Or do you think it's ultimately gonna converge on maybe one or two? Hmm. I think there will be, there will be regional splits tethered for China, you know, maybe die for the Western half of the US, but like, we'll see, uh, you know, synthetics for traders or SUSD for traders, um, USDC for kind of like institutionals, uh, you know, there will be different flavors. I think what's really interesting is, you know, if you can combine these in a protocol that acts as a stable coin clearinghouse, you can token tokenize the underlying assets and make a meta stable token. And if people then use that as a method of payment, like that's the kind of one coin to rule them all uh, reality that, that plays out in the stable coin kind of space. Yeah, I think in a short period of time, I mean, this market is still very, very uh, unsaturated. There's gonna be a lot of players and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, right? Uh, it's actually a good thing. I mean, we think everyone is trying to get into blockchain, well, blockchain game. They're companions, there's not competitors, right? Um, the, we are targeting the 99.9% of the, of the people that is, haven't get into the crypto yet and the market is so big out there. So, I mean, even if someone's doing the similar stuff, we think it's like the reinforcement of what we're trying to do, to bring like um, your own asset, to control your own asset, to have like full transparency, um, to have like no censorship on your assets. So those is a good thing. and. The, I think we will see a lot of um, different stablecoin before we actually see something like a meta stablecoin, SDR lights of stablecoin. Um, we think we'll see a lot of um, variety to, to pop up. Yeah, it seems like what the place you'd want to be is the metal stablecoin. Yeah, <laughs> that's the position you want. Yeah. <laughs> you can get this business. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, are there other things that you want to talk about before we maybe open up for Q and A or, or do some do like a demo or something? Yeah, I question for for Jack Platts. Um, what's the difference between Kusama and Polkadot? Well, I'm definitely glad you brought that up. Um, and what do people want to know. So, there's a recent blog post on this that actually dives into it a little bit um, around the cousins around. The, Polkadot versus Kusama and what each of them are, are, are particularly good for. Um, but since, and, and I have my own perspective on this and like a, definitely a strong opinion on this, but Roy Tao, I mean, you're launching two, two blockchains, two instances of 
Akala, right? One on Kusama, yeah. uh, the Canary Network, and one on Polkadot. Why, why, why are you guys doing that? Okay, um, I think this slide, this slide, obvious reason that why there's two networks. One of them is a low value test net, a test net with value. Uh, for us to test something and to make sure that if we screw up, we didn't screw up big. And it's it's good thing, right? Um, that's why the Kusama is called the wild card of Polkadot. It has value, so people behave like it. it it's like not free test net, so people behave differently. Uh, but it also has um, not critical amount of value, so you can explore stuff before you roll it into the mainnet. So that's what we see, like um, maybe you have uh, the test net, and we have a proof of authority test net right now, has no value. And then there will be like Kusama is the staging server, and then Kodo is the, the production server. Mm. Yeah, and I think so. I think there's I think there's two major use cases. One is definitely the stepping stone, right, a, a between a testnet and a mainnet, um, especially for Polkadot. Like it's um, a lot of the things in it from the um, from the governance to the staking, uh, definitely to the shard to the shard uh, the sharding like uh, architecture is untried. So there could be bugs, right? And I think the having having a high uh, a potentially high stakes environment in Kusama out there charting the way, right? Acting as the the canary in the coal mine, coal mine as it were, uh, figuring this out is is important. Um, but then um, I think there's another like set of use cases in chains that otherwise wouldn't have access to the dots necessary to lease a parachain slot on Polkadot through the community lease slots. I mean, there's gonna be, the first probably parachain is going to be just simply offloading logic from the relay chain, maybe like parachain auctions or something simple like this. Um, governance, I mean, you could take and unbundle the relay chain into different parachains eventually for, for efficiency once XCMP is working or interchain message passing is working. Um, but uh, I think there's gonna be things like chains that don't wanna like, just deploy to Polkadot for whatever reason. I mean, I think over 60% of the tokens have over already changed hands on Kusama in the past couple months. So it's a totally different user base um, in terms of who owns the tokens. Um, and it's gonna, and it already is kind of a different builder base as well. Uh, there's overlap for sure, more so than like between Polkadot and Ethereum, but um, there's distinct communities there, distinct brands, visions. I mean, the meme is really strong with the Kusama comrades. And I think, uh, I think all of that, <laughs> you know, equate the to, to winning formula. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Um, so, uh, Roy Tao, do you want to give your uh, demo? And then if anyone in the audience has any questions, we're happy to answer them, answer them as well. Yeah, um, I don't know. Um, how can we share my screen? All right, so to share your screen, um, I would need to remove Vance very quickly. And then from there, you can go to hover of your face, share screen. Yeah. Perfect. So can anyone see my screen right now? So Jack, can you see my screen? Yes. So yeah, I think just gonna do a very quick demo of how the Akala stablecoin uh, front end app is working. Uh, we have a test net, uh, we have an excellent, uh, I think we have like over, 50, uh, 50 nodes that's running. Um, just want to give you a quick update on like how mature this um, substrate colored art um, space is. And it's already, it's very, very viable for you to start developing something on top of that already. So we can see that um, I'm connected with this, um, the Polkadot.js, which is uh, the, the MetaMart equivalent for the Polkadot network. Um, I'm now in my wallet. I can see I hold certain map tokens. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna quickly take out a loan. So I would say that I'm gonna uh, maybe deposit 0 0.05 XBTC, which is the cross-chain version of the Bitcoin. Uh, type in my password, slide the transaction, and see how fast this is. So it's confirmed within less than like three seconds, which is I think the configuration of our block time. And now I can borrow more AUSD. I can say that I wanna generate maybe 100 AUSD. Things just confirm. And I just took out another loan of 100 USD. Uh, what's unique in this, um, in our uh, implementation is that we also have the DEX built in. That means um, this decentralized exchange, a Uniswap like decentralized exchange, is already built in. So you can swap your thought for AUSD. You can do the opposite weight. So you can buy AUSD 
by dollars AUSD. And one other feature that we can probably give it an, an, a quick look is the L dot. So this is something that's quite new. Um, so that means, um, um, as people might know, there's like uh, stake dots. If you want to unbond those stake dots, it require like a week for, for it to become unbound. But in our protocol, you can say that, hey, uh, I want to stake dot through your protocol. So I get a receipt of that stake dot and I can freely trade it. I can also redeem it. I can choose to redeem it immediately and pay a fee. Um, so if I still want to say that, it's going to, I mean, we have some dummy fee here, which is high. If you want to say that I really need that dot right now, you can do it, but we're going to charge you some fee. Or you say that I want to redeem it in X amount of time and the fee will be adjusted. Um, the reason that we come up with this L dot is that, hey, um, on the, on the on the polka dots, the dot itself has like stake utility, right? So if you want to choose like I want to lock up my dots to create a USD or I want to stake it, you have to choose either one. But if with the L dot, you can you can your, your money could be in both places. I can choose to stake, I can have an L dot, and then I can choose to say that I want to take a, take out a loan against the L dot. So your money is essentially in two places. So that's pretty much it. The quick overload of the Arcana network, which is like a customized chain built on top of Polkadot, on top of Substrate. How long did it take you to? Is that based on Polkadot JS, the UI, uh, to to connect to your Akala node, or and is the how long did it take you guys to build uh, what we just saw? Well, it, uh, we started like October last year, uh, and we pretty much get this status like maybe a a month ago. So. It took, less, took us less than three months to come up with the chain uh, with the front-end dev. I mean, it's already a very mature uh, framework. Um, it's in beta status, so um, given um, there will be some check you need to work around, but, um, and, um, but overall, the substrate is an, it's an, it's an awesome uh, framework for you to build your customized chain. So how, how much time do you think Substrate um, saved you in building a Kala and uh, in preparing for for launching a you know standalone chain that that has all the the, the properties Akala does from the from the synthetics to the uh, to the stablecoin to the uh, staking derivative um, and the wow. to build the DeFi <laughs> applications on top of it. Well, that would be yes, right? Otherwise, if you want to build a full blockchain, that would be yes. Like you need to handle the consensus, you need to handle the peer to peer, you need to handle the storage. So don't do it. Don't do it. If you want to build a chain, choose a framework, either Substrate or Cosmos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's. And and you also get the access to the ecosystem, right? Is is yeah. uh, it, it's difficult to imagine that many more chains coming about who don't aren't connected to the rest of you know Web three or other crypto networks, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, questions from the audience. So. What what are the most interesting things that you guys see emerging in cross-chain DeFi to add value to the ecosystem, which a single chain isn't able to accomplish? So I guess that means a different way of framing that is what chains are you excited for Akala to be able to speak to? And then maybe Vance, you could ask uh, answer it from the um, the world of, 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 of Cosmos. Well, definitely Bitcoin, right? So if we can have a trustless bridges between Bitcoins and Pagadot, and because Akala is built on top of um, Pagadot, means we have a trustless bridge to Bitcoin. Um, that will unlock the full potential of Bitcoin, right? People hoping Bitcoin can can collectorize their Bitcoin and take out a loan um, that just unlock the full utility of um, Bitcoin. Mm. I think, uh, I mean, in terms of cross-chain stuff that I'm excited about, uh, one is the idea of you can invert exchange infrastructure if you have like a pooled uh, Uniswap model that's cross-chain. So like instead of everybody holding stuff on exchanges, like we would pull them all in this Uniswap that goes cross-chain that can earn you yield on those trades. Um, I think that's a pretty interesting idea. Uh, the other one that I think is interesting is instead of going like horizontal, uh, I, I think there's a chance that like going from like Polkadot to Ethereum, like I think, I think there's a chance that if you build a performant enough blockchain that's vertically focused, you can start to tap into uh, like US retail savings accounts and things like that and, and start to like almost build a bank. And I think that's like kind of cross chain, not like in the way you typically think of it, but like starting to communicate with leg legacy financial systems is I think a lot of where this goes. And so I think that would classify as something that I'm excited in, uh, in about uh, cross chain. Any uh, teams doing that or entry points into the like legacy financial system that you see as more promising, whether it's like fiat on ramps or um, 
or or access to actual merchants or what what, what in, in particular yeah. uh, do you see as potentially easier to penetrate? Uh, I think um, I mean we've funded a couple projects coming out, so uh, I think in the next couple months the those are those will be live and. And we're excited for those to take the real first swing at things like risk modeling by credit scores. And you know, if you default on a on a loan on DeFi, like there's going to be a debt collector coming after you. Like there's like <laughs> well, there's a lot of different incentives that the legacy financial infrastructure uses that DeFi doesn't. And I think you know DeFi is good for a lot of things: pooling capital, organizing people, setting programmatic terms for loans, for uh, margin, for futures, like whatever it is. Like we should use it for that and we should combine it with the best parts of uh, centralized finance um, just because you can extend the incentive structures even further and i think there's a subset of people in DeFi that won't like sign up for a loan where you have to like put in information but i think this is what allows us to tap into a larger retail market that'll expand the market size to retail's point it's like we're arguing over like 0.005 percent of the market right now like the bigger opportunity is obviously external to blockchain Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you guys so much for doing this panel. It was really educational. So we're out of time and we need to transition to the next session. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank if you guys you. have any additional questions for them, feel free to reach out directly uh, via their Twitter or do you guys have a preferred channel? Yeah, hit me up on Twitter. I am Vance. Twitter's great. All right. Thanks so much.